and welcome to the Entrepreneurs in a Game podcast. I'm Nina Cork, and we have got a wonderful treat in store for you today. I have a very special guest, Adam Hermy. Now, Adam is the founder and creator of the Business Creators Institute, which helps entrepreneurs just like you to win in the game of business and marketing so you can thrive from the intersection of your brilliance and passion. For years, he's been the secret weapon in the arsenal of dozens of entrepreneurs, business creators, executive marketing solution providers, and professional service providers. He's also the host of the wildly popular Business Creators radio show and speaks around the country. Plus, he's the author of the international Amazon best-selling book, Groundhog Day is an Event, Not a Business Strategy. Adam, welcome to the Entrepreneurs in a Game podcast. I'm delighted to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me as well. This is a very exciting opportunity, and I've been following your work for some time. You do great work, and I'm honored to be invited to play at least a small part in how you deliver your brilliance and your passion to your audience. Fantastic. I, and think I, have and a- I know it's kind of angelic behind me here. Um, <laughs> we're, in, uh, we're just having a really bright, sunny day here, and hey, we'll take them where we can get them. Fantastic. I'm glad you're in the sunshine. I'm in the rain at the moment in England, but there we go. Right. Adam, I would love to know how you got started on this amazing journey you've been on and specifically what role mindset has played, how your inner game has helped you along the way and also how it's hindered you. Okay, so basically this is the first of a 25-part series. You want me to tell the whole story? (laughs) Well, we've got half an hour. (laughs) All right, so we can do the Cliff Notes version here. I graduated from college or university, and then I went out and uh, did the job thing. And after about a year of that, decided to go back and pursue my MBA, which is a Master's in business, Business Administration. So the same time I did that, I found another job, and then I got promoted there. Then I completed the MBA. Then I did the whole networking thing, getting job offers, things like that. At the time, my goal, my vision was to become a training and development director for a Fortune 500 company. I loved the idea of training and development, of human organizational development. I had been working in a training department for two years while I was pursuing my MBA. My MBA concentration was human resource management. So I did the whole job search thing. I got a couple job offers. I had a couple companies that were interested in creating a job just for me, even though they weren't officially hiring at the time. But then what happened is I ended up reconnecting with one of my previous mentors, a gentleman named Stephen who at this point in his journey was the owner of a training and development company. So I came on doing some what we would call freelance work with him to develop his presentations, content for his books, uh, analysis of his survey data that he did with employees of his various clients. And the entrepreneurial bug bit me. So I formed a corporation and I did this with Stephen and a few other clients on the side for two years while I was still finding my way out of my day job. Now, the issue there and how it took until September 2005 to make that jump and become a full-time entrepreneur is quite simply, and I think this is an issue that a lot of folks face, is that I didn't know what I didn't know. At one point, somebody offered to give me, not loan, give me $3,000 United States if I would quit my job and give them proof that I had submitted notice. Knowing what I know now, that was like a gift from heaven, and it was much more than I even needed to make that work, but I didn't know what I didn't know, and I didn't have the belief in such things, so I thought the person was crazy, and I turned it down. Meanwhile, I could have gotten a show on the road almost a year earlier, but again, I didn't know what I didn't know, and I think when we talk about mindset and how it impacts entrepreneurs, the fact that in some place in our mind, we don't know what we don't know is an inhibitor because we may see opportunities in front of us and be leery of acting upon them because we don't know that we have the skill sets, the mindsets, the tool sets. And at the same time, we're also aware there's something out there that we may not have access to, and we just may not know the questions to ask. The one constant in this world is change. One of the most frightening things in the world is change, even positive change, because we don't know what that's going to bring to us. And as a result, I think that that can hold a lot of entrepreneurs back in ways that actually, 
even though they know that some of it may amount to self-sabotage, it actually feels more comfortable for them. So I'm hoping we can unravel just a bit of that in the time we have together. Absolutely. And you said something really interesting. You said that change can be frightening. Yes. And it can feel fearful, can't it? Because suddenly, yes. even when there's a new opportunity and we don't feel that we can step into that opportunity, there's something holding us back. Yes, that's very true. So what changed for you then? You said you didn't take that opportunity at that point because there was some lack of belief within yourself. Mm -hmm. Did you learn well, something from that experience that helped you to move on? Well, what I discovered is that pretty much anything is really possible. And what I learned to really get a handle on is worst case scenario. Now we're always supposed to think of the best case scenario through the mindset and the visioning and manifest the millions of dollars coming our way. But I would urge people to be aware of your worst case scenario. Now be aware of your real worst case scenario. Not, and it's not always really that everything's going to fall apart. See, if I had taken that $3,000 and it took a while for my business to take off, and that $3,000 wasn't the magic elixir, my real worst case scenario is it would have taken me probably a few extra months to move out of my parents' house. That's what my real worst case scenario would have been. The business would have still worked one way or another because once I became a full-time entrepreneur, I found I was doing a lot of things that I'd never dreamed of doing simply because the opportunities presented themselves, and it sounded like fun. So... Having the bandwidth to go after it would have solved that problem eventually. Um, another case may be that you look at a potential joint venture, a potential deal that you get into working with another person. And doing worst case scenario can be helpful to you because it can expose gaps in what you're proposing. See, we go to conferences, we go to seminars, and you, know, you may have you know, experience some of this yourself. You uh, sit through the day of seminar, then you go to the evening networking reception, and you manage to meet somebody, and you manage to get through two cocktails with them without having a stupid political argument. And based on that, you know that this is the one that you've been looking for all along. And you are going to form this brilliant joint venture that's going to change lives. And you're now inexorably joined at the hip with this person. And we are going to just blow this up big time. But then you forget to think about what's the worst case scenario that could happen from that. And when you look at that, it's not necessarily a cause for pessimism, but now it makes you think maybe we should clearly define what is in the joint venture so that this other person doesn't think that they now suddenly own half my business and I've thrown the whole lot in. Or maybe this tells me that we should form a separate corporation of some sort with its own bank account just to identify what belongs to this and what belongs to the rest of the world. Maybe we should be absolutely clear on to what extent this branding will become part of my business or not. So when we eliminate some of these areas of doubt that can be relatively simply eliminated, that helps us at the inner game because now we have cleared things from our mind that enables us to have a greater vision, which can bring in more great things. Yes, it's almost like staring your fear in the face and saying, yes. okay, so what can I do? What can I put in place that will stop this Correct. situation from arising? And how did you grow your self-belief from those early days? Okay, this is a funny story. I had gotten in a situation with my business where I had so many clients. Uh, most of them were great, but have you ever had a client from hell? <laughs> I'm not answering that question. <laughs> uh, we'll, 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 uh, we'll, uh, we'll take that answer as a yes. I had three at the same time. And where I got these three clients from hell at the same time is I did not have sufficient belief in myself that I could truly screen who I brought into my business. So basically, anybody sent me a referral, I felt obligated that I had to work with the person being referred to me, even when from the very moment I first interacted with them, I saw more red flags than you would see in Tiananmen Square on, red, on May Day. So anyway, anyway, we had gotten to this one morning where these three particular clients, just with the combination of everything, had run me so ragged that I'd forgotten to go to a grocery store, and I'd woken up that morning with no breakfast food. So in order to break fast, which really is a biological process that just jumpstarts your metabolism from the sleep mode by eating anything, really, I ate toothpaste because I couldn't get to the store. Now, finally, 
we get a moment between all this cacophony where I had a moment to breathe. And I thought, okay, my client, my, my, my accountant needs a paper, a piece of paper signed and sent back to him. That's easy. My accountant's a good guy. And he sends me stuff in a timely fashion so we get signed off and keep me in good graces with the Internal Revenue Service. So halfway through printing this piece of paper, my printer decides to run out of ink. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm eating toothpaste. I don't have time to replace the piece of paper that just got wasted because you couldn't let me know in advance you didn't have enough ink to print a one-page grayscale document. Two years later, when I moved out of that apartment and moved into a nicer apartment, I was still finding pieces of that printer under the furniture. Yeah, that's right. I smashed my printer into a thousand pieces. So if things could get that bad, I was able to take a pause, pause, and recognize that two things were happening. Very important. In this moment, things were really awful. I mean, I'm smashing up my office equipment. I'm going all office space on my own business because of the clients I've let in. And what I don't know, what I don't know at this point about how to handle these situations, it's one thing. But the other is, is I have the power to right now draw a line and say, we can change this. We can ask new questions. We can move forward in different directions and we can fix this problem. Within about three weeks, I had all the issues resolved in the business that led to that moment. And when I, when I got to the catalytic point where the final one of those clients from hell finally got resolved, because in one case, um, we agreed that we didn't want to work together, but we'd finish the project and leave everything else aside, and that's fine. With another one, we recognized there was just a misalignment in communication. We fixed that, and we worked together brilliantly. The third one just had to go. And this one was just so hard to get rid of. I actually said to him, literally use the words, you're fired. And he wouldn't hear that. So finally, he just himself recognized that he needed to go. And he just said, all right, I get the point. I'll go somewhere else. At that moment, I heard birds chirping again. So the point I want to make is that when you are able to harness some control over your journey, that can help you with your mindset because you can recognize that no matter how bad it gets, there are always new questions to ask, new decisions to make, new avenues to pursue that can lead you down a better path. That's a great, great story. I love your story. And you, you said something that was really great. You said to take a pause. When you're in the midst yes. of everything, it can be very, very hard to step back can't it because you just feel uh, you're fighting all these fires it's overwhelmed you're exhausted you don't know where to turn and you're just not enjoying your business what i've discovered in myself and i've also coached clients on this is just when you think you're ready to boil over and just when you think you're actually justified in taking somebody else to the woodshed that's actually your physiology and your mentality telling you that if there was ever a time you need to calm down this is it because there's a lesson coming up but it's having the, um, the, 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 making the space in your thinking to actually yes. look at that lesson because it's so easy just to keep going, keep going, burn out, and, you know, just getting yourself into a complete um, meltdown about what's going on. Just Correct. taking a pause and thinking, how can I fix this problem? Correct. And that's exactly what you did. And, if, and that's what helped you to move on and make some big decisions, which probably turned your business around. It certainly helped uh, because a year later, we began actually the first step in the transition towards basically where I've ended up today, even though that was about 10 years ago. Because for that first couple of years in business, I took on a lot of opportunities doing something that was fun, but I discovered wasn't really what I wanted to be doing with my business in life. But hey, the referrals were there, the deals were easy to make, and the work wasn't really that hard. But And on the surface, it was enjoyable stuff to do but it wasn't really what I wanted. And it wasn't really in alignment with my truths. So in the long run, the effect was cumulative. I'd like to go back to the sort of questions we can ask ourselves when we feel that we're in a rabbit hole and we can't dig ourselves out and it just feels like right. everything is too much. So what sort of questions can we ask ourselves to get some clarity about what's going on and start making some decisions to get ourselves into a much, much better space? Well, to just to, just to reiterate, the, the realizations are, A, this is awful, but B, I can ask new questions, make new discoveries, and make new decisions that will move me 
forward towards a potentially better solution, better result, better place. Another thing to bear in mind, again, is looking at your worst case scenario so you see how bad it can really be, because you'll usually recognize that A, it's not going to get that bad, and B, just having that awareness will enable you to put things in place that will reduce the chance of anything like that even happening. So a third tactic that I can give you, and I have to give credit for this to one of my own business mentors, speaker Paul Ross, is the phrase up until now. And again, this has to do with mindset, inner game, and clearing the path. And when you can do this, you'll see how the world can open up for you. And when you can say up until now, let me give you an example. You may say, uh, you know, I'm awful with relationships. I keep finding these guys that are just lying, cheating, loser jerks, and I'm never going to find a good fellow, and I'm going to end up a spinster. So what you can say instead is, up until now, it has been the case that the men I have invited into my life are not in alignment with my vision for what I want in my life partner. Now, I claim my choice to make the decisions that will help me attract that person who, with whom I can create wonderful things and we can gel together in every way. So by simply drawing a line under it and saying up until now, and you know, whether it's a, a man or a woman or whatever it is you're looking for, you know, the same thing applies. So by saying up until now, you're saying, yeah, up until now, this has been the case. I don't need to batter myself for it because I have not actually done anything wrong. It's just how it has been. There's nothing I necessarily need to apologize for. I don't need to dwell on this. So I'm simply drawing the line, taking a moment to pause and recognize what has brought me here and saying from this point forward, we are going to do things differently. We're going to make new decisions, new discoveries, and take new paths. So it allows you to, without judgment, that's going to hold you back even further and impact your inner game, just draw a line, say, this is why we're here. This is how we got here. Now we're going to do this instead. Yeah. Now, if we want to flip this over to entrepreneurship, there's another powerful question. And I cover this. This is so important. I actually cover it twice inside the Groundhog book. I actually repeat a subsection of a chapter almost word for word. That's how important this is. Ask yourself with what you're doing in your business, and even what you're doing in your day-to-day -day life, ask this question. What would happen if I did not do this at all? What would happen if I did not do this at all? And in business, in the team environment, you could say, what would happen if we did not do this at all? And what you'll discover is you may have developed processes for your business, your team, and yourself that were, temp that were permanent overreactions to minor temporary situations. And as a result, you're being governed and allowing yourself and your organization to be governed by things that don't even matter. Again, so often, policies, rules, and decisions are permanent overreactions to minor temporary situations. And simply by asking that question, we can identify those so we can set those aside. We can create more space. And because we're now creating more mind space, it will impact our inner game because we'll be able to see new things now that there's space within our bandwidth that we can start filling with different visions, different ideas, and different discoveries. Great. Oh, that's a great question. And if we're stressing about something and decide that if we didn't do this, it doesn't matter, then we can just let go of that. Yeah, I think that, I think that goes back to having a relationship with uncertainty. And I'm going to be candid and say that I do not have a good relationship with uncertainty. I don't like things to hang out there. I don't like guessing games. I don't like riddles. So one could say, well, you need to learn how to become more adept at that. Yes, everybody likes you. We know <laughs> that's happened to me a couple of times. So, um, yeah, so we can say that, yeah, let's become more adept at being familiar with uncertainty. Now, another way you can look at that is, although this entire situation is entirely uncertain, and I cannot get an answer to this right now, what can I create certainty about? So let's say, for instance, you are in a business dispute and you know that there, you know, know that there's some potential problem looming with a business partner, with a client, where it may be in a case where you're the client and they're the, res and they're the resource provider, and there's some sort of issue, whatever it is, and you can't get this solved right now. 
So what are some small things you can do to create certainty? One of which is, is maybe things are a little heated and it's not, we're not really in a place where you can create a resolution, but what you can do is you can schedule a time for the discussion. So you reach out or you know, they reach out and you schedule the time for the discussion so you can say, yeah, I have this looming problem, but we know that Tuesday at three o'clock, we're gonna have the discussion about it. So until then, I'm going to set this aside because I cannot do anything until such time. However, something has been done about it so that I know that there will be progress of some sort after Tuesday at three o'clock. Another thing you can do, and this is, and you can translate this different ways into different situations. I'm just using the idea of a business relationship as an example, is you may decide that uh, this is a toleration you're just not going to accept. So you can also put a similar deadline on the situation. I've sadly had to do this with business relationships before, where I've had to say, you know, I have made a number of reasonable efforts to attempt to resolve this. And I am just continually being asked the same questions that I've already answered 10 times. I'm being told things that uh, just do not align with my truth here that I do not see as being factual. So, uh, or let me give you another example where uh, you're encountering passive aggression, whether it's in person or business. So per passive aggression being placed upon you can create a lot of uncertainty because that's the whole point behind it basically is it creates uncertainty for the recipients. So one thing you can say is that, you know, you appreciate that there's a situation that you need to resolve here or work on one way or the other. And if we cannot make steps forward towards that by say Wednesday at two o'clock, then we have to deem that the relationship is over or that the relationship has turned a page and we're now in a different place or however you need to phrase that depending on the situation. So uh, with the recip receiving of passive aggressiveness, that creates an area of uncertainty, but you can add certainty to it by putting a deadline for yourself in the situation and communicating that clearly to them, which basically puts upon them, which is set aside the passive aggressiveness and come to the table, or I'm simply going to draw a line on this in my life and move on to another opportunity. Great. Okay. That's, that sounds like some really, really good ways of dealing with difficult situations. Yes. How do you personally deal with setbacks when something doesn't go the way that you want it to go? Maybe, you know, it's um, a launch or a promotion or you want to reach out to someone and they don't get back to you. How do you deal with setbacks? Well, some of those uh, examples are very micro that you gave. And you also gave a couple macro examples of setbacks. And this goes back to my background as an undergraduate at the Pennsylvania State University, where my major was political science. And we um, looked at how various countries have handled victories and defeats in various types of wars, whether of the military type or the trade type or the wars of words or what have you, is rule number one in, in nation state stuff is always declare victory. So regardless of whatever setback it is, look for the victory. Now, another way you can look at this, and I cover this inside the Groundhog book, is you've heard that cliche or that saying that every cloud has a silver lining. So you look for that silver lining and remember that silver is a precious metal. Commodities traders and others invest in silver for a reason. It has value. So take those two things I just shared with you and combine them. You declare victory and you invest in the silver. So no matter what happens, even if it is a uh, pretty much a calamity, you can find something within it that will help you take your next step. You may have a little bit of a challenge seeing that in a moment, which is goes back to why sometimes just when you're ready to boil over, that's your, the universe and your physiology telling you that now is especially the time to remain calm because a powerful lesson is about to appear. Uh, but that's what you do, declare victory and invest in the silver lining. And that's how you find things. Now, what that's translated to in my personal experience is some folks saying, you know, you know, you can never admit you're wrong and you have an answer for everything. And I say, no, it's not that I can't admit I'm wrong. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. I mean, I, but, but, but I don't say, I don't put it within that mind frame. I say that in any situation, if there's a correction that needs to be made, I'll make it. If there's an amend that I feel needs to be made, notice that phraseology very carefully. If there's an amend that I feel needs to be made, I'll make it but I'm not going to punish myself and declare myself being grievously wrong when uh, this is really 
as 99% of the things in this life are speed bumps in the road. And you can discover something from that speed bump because having gone over that bump, it's now brought you out of any potential trance state you might have been as you're going through life and brought your mm -hmm. consciousness into sharp relief where a new lesson or a new discovery will appear and you'll be wide awake to receive it. Yeah. Yeah. Those speed bumps in life can turn out to be absolute blessings, can't they? Because they get yes. you out of your stupor and, yes. and, and it's a jolt you wide awake sometimes. Yes. So Adam, how can our listeners and our viewers find out more about you and your work? I would encourage everybody, I'm just going to put this out there, to consider my book, Groundhog Day is an Event, Not a Business Strategy. It's available on Amazon. Uh, there's a paperback version. There's also a very inexpensive Kindle version. I uh, do not know exactly what that translates into, into pounds sterling or yen or anything like that, or rupees or the ruble or anything like that. I know in the United States dollars, it's usually just a couple bucks. Mm -hmm. So I make it very inexpensive because I want people to have that entree. Most of the stories that I've shared with you today are included in the book, and there are a couple main themes I want you to get from that, one of which is that by approaching things from a place of minimalism, we can achieve maximum results. That goes back to that question, do we need to be doing this at all? And we also discovered that many times it's within the small things that we can sometimes find our biggest discoveries as we see that those are the things that are really slowing us down, stopping us, and holding us back. So you think of the behavior of that animal called the groundhog. In your part of the world, I believe it's called the marmot, but at other places in the world, it's called the woodchuck. It's that little animal that has the really wide shoulders, and right? And they burrow beneath surfaces. They get under your foundation, and they sometimes create little things under there that could potentially destabilize your business and your life. Now, at the same time, when you surface that groundhog, you can see the burrow that they've dug. And their burrows can be very sophisticated, like the houses that we as humans live in. And when they surface their soil, what will happen is it will, you know, when it, when it surfaces that soil, what will happen is that soil can spread on your side of the fence and grow the greener grass for you to experience. Brilliant. I love it. We always, talk, we always talk about the grass being greener on the other side of the fence. So bearing in mind that when a groundhog digging a burrow surfaces all that soil, that fertilizes your side of the fence, Absolutely. which is why groundhogs, although to an extent they're predators on farms, they're also, they're also allies of the farmer because they help till the soil that grows the crops. Yeah, it sounds like a great read. I'd encourage everyone to go out and get the book and, um, and pick up some great tips. Adam, thank yeah. you so much for being here and sharing your wisdom, your mindset, your inner game. It's been absolutely brilliant. And for everyone who's been listening and watching, I hope you've really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, bye-bye for now.